Would you please join me in the spirit of prayer? Let us dwell together in peace. Let us not be instruments of our own or of others' oppression. And now may only truth be spoken. May only truth be heard. Amen. Early in their marriage, George Burns and Gracie Allen, George had a brief extramarital affair. And he confessed to his wife, Gracie, that he had had this indiscretion, and as an apology, he bought her a new coffee table. (laughs) Because, you know, romance. And um, but he did, he bought her a new coffee table, and it was never discussed again. Well, it might have come up once, uh, at least once more. One day, George overheard Gracie in the living room having tea with a friend, and as she poured the tea, she said to her guest, I wish George would have another affair. I need a new coffee table. A second event meant to bring something new, right? That's not an exact match to today's reading, but it's close enough for jazz. Our first reading today is from the Acts of the Apostles, which is basically Luke's Gospel, Volume 2. Luke's Gospel is about Jesus, and Acts is about the Jesus movement immediately following Jesus' execution. Luke is writing 60 to 80 years after Jesus' execution, So he states up front that he's researched what he's writing about. He does that in Luke and in Acts, that he's done the research. He's asked around, he's heard the stories, he's he's read up on things, he's read the book of Mark, it's in front of him, as we'll see later. And so he's done the research. He obviously wasn't an eyewitness to these things, but he wants folk to believe that he's done his homework. And then he launches right into the story about Jesus' ascension and promise to return. The church by this time has been waiting around 80 years for that return, for the whole existence of the church, basically. It's been waiting for that return. And that's a long time to wait. Some people are still waiting. They should give it up, and I'll explain why later in a bit. Uh, I wanted, I I didn't do it at 9 o'clock. I was so tempted to say, I'm so glad, usually the Sunday after Easter is a bit down, you know, and I wanted to say to them, I'm so glad you came today because I understand that after tomorrow, there's going to be no more chances. So, it's because the eclipse, the apocalypse, people have been waiting and pretending and guessing over and over and over when some cataclysmic thing will start a new world for us. Well, it's been about a zillion years, and I just don't have any patience to wait anymore. But I don't think we have to. I don't think we need to. But even 80 years in, people are starting to get impatient. And so, after a better part of the century waiting... Luke tries to calm their nerves with this account. He says that after Jesus' suffering, that is, his being tortured to death, that he presented himself to his friends. He he, he died, he he, he was arrested and, and, and executed, and then he died, and somehow we still get him. We still experience him. We still hear from him. He's still with us somehow. And so somehow he didn't really stay dead, not to us. And now he's visiting the old team. And he remains with them for 40 days. That's the only time we ever heard that in Scripture, right? Something about 40 days. No. It's over and over and over this 40, which makes me think it's more literary than literal. 40 is one of those numbers that pop up over and over in Scripture. 40 years wandering, and then the land of promise, finally. 40 days of rain, and then the deluge stops, finally. Finally. Forty days in the wilderness, and then Jesus emerges ready, ready for his ministry, finally. Moses spends 40 days on a mountain, and later so will Elijah, the same mountain. And in both cases, they encounter the divine in ways that changes them, finally. Now, resurrected Jesus hangs around for 40 days. Hmm. The pattern continues these Midrash traditions of where you keep telling the same story over and over and over, new people, new circumstances, but it's the same story with the same metaphors and idioms and and figures of speech. And so 40 suggests a journey. It's a long time. It's a long process. It's a journey, either inward or outward, that leads to a discovery, an aha moment, a breakthrough, or a new beginning. 40 days could be three hours or 100 years. When we see post-Golgotha Jesus hanging out with his old friends for 40 days, 
we know that what we're really seeing is that those friends are having a time of growth and learning and healing, and that this period of, of time, of, of working through it, of working it out, will lead to something new and powerful. Jesus tells his team, I want you to stay in Jerusalem. Stay in Jerusalem. Now, they've seen him, you know, come back. We saw you dead, now you're here giving us instructions. And so what we really want to do is not stay. We want to run and hide, because this is a little creepy, a little crazy. This is scary. If we tell people, if we tell the people who killed you that we don't think it, it took, we might be next. So Jesus says, stay. Stay in Jerusalem. Jerusalem means city of peace. Stay in peace. Stay centered. Stay calm. This is a transitional and uncertain time, but remember, you can go to peace instead of to pieces. We can't control what's going on out there, but we can model how to have calm in the midst of a storm. We can model how to have freedom in spite of exile. We can go to peace instead of to pieces, and the world needs us to do that. Jesus says, you know all about the water ritual we call baptism. John did it a lot. But very soon, you're going to be immersed in spirit and sprinkled with fire. Baptism means to immerse or to wash. You are going to be immersed in spirit and washed with fire. And then he floats away and disappears. This is symbolic rather than literal. And do you know how we know? Because he's floating away. Right? So that probably didn't happen just that way. But it means, it's a symbol, it's a way of saying that he has been raised. Yes, this terrible thing happened, but it's not the end, because he has been raised into the eternal presence of God. That's what resurrection means. That's what ascension means. That's what the, 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 the parousia, or return, means. He has been raised into the eternal presence of God. Like the resurrection stories, this ascension narrative is another way of saying he's still around. And he'll always be around, because he's with God, and God is eternal and omnipresent. Now, we're always all part of God, but somehow Jesus has passed through a door, has passed into another realm, and so he gets it even more than he did. And so he's even more present than he was. Before, we could only see him one at a time. We could only hug him one at a time. We could only have many people sit around the table, we could eat with him at a time. But now he is part of that omnipresent experience. So he's always with us, and, and he will always will be. Now, in the story, he's rising up. And some bystanders ask Jesus' friends, why are you so amazed? Because he floated away. Weren't you paying attention? That doesn't happen every day. But the bystander says, he'll be back. He'll return the same way. This is a great clue. I love this clue. He'll return the same way he left. And team Jesus then goes back to the city, to the upper room, where other disciples are praying, and Mary is with them. Tradition says that Mary was the kind of the house mother uh, to that group at that time. She was the leader of the team in those uncertain days. She was sort of the pastor or interim pastor of this, of this transitional house church going on in this upper room. So, of course, they saw Mary with the disciples. She was in charge. Now, if we read just a bit more into the very next chapter, we'll see. What do we see? That, that Pentecost narrative we see Jesus' spirit descending on the disciples. They saw Jesus ascend, and then just a couple of days later, we see the spirit of it. He is, he's joined with spirit. He's now part of spirit. That's what the ascension is. And now we see that spirit returning to us, that he ascends, and then his spirit descends, that he comes back the same way he left, just like the clue said. Oh, he's leaving, but he's coming back the exact same way. And so Christ is returning in the way they saw him leave. He was carried off by the winds, and now he's returning as a mighty wind in the upper room. As Elijah bestowed a double portion of his spirit on Elisha. And we see that. We see how that works out. That, that he asked for a double portion. And then as Elijah is ascending into the heavens, throws his mantle on him and he gets that double portion. And then that is, that is made manifest when, uh, when Elisha's bones, someone touches his bones after he's dead. And they throw this, this uh, uh, dead body, this corpse, into his tomb. And when that corpse, that fresh corpse, touches Elisha's bones, it comes back to life. 
because it's got a double portion of the prophet spirit. Well, now, here is, here is Jesus pouring a multiplied portion of his spirit on his disciples. Oh, wait, this is like Elijah. Yeah, that's how the storytelling works in the Bible. Same story, new circumstances, new dates, new characters, but it's always the same thing. This thing that has happened always happens and will happen. We can count on it. It's not about the person it happens to. It's about that it does happen, and it can happen, and it will happen, and so it will happen for us. And so we see Jesus pouring a multiplied portion of his spirit on his disciples. And instead of water being poured on their heads, flames are dancing above them. They're being baptized with fire, immersed in spirit, filled with power. And the church is now, that young church, just decades old, now is the returned and resurrected body of Christ. Mark said, people had Jesus saying, now Jesus is supposed to be talking while he's alive, which would be the year 29. Mark is writing in 70. 70s when the temple and Jerusalem was destroyed. So when people in the New Testament are dreaming about a new Jerusalem, it's because they need one. The old one's in, in ruins. And so Mark is saying, having Jesus say, but in Mark's lifetime, which is decades later, some of you hearing me won't die before this happens. Well, then they all die. And so Matthew says, uh, yeah, that was unfortunate, but really nobody knows. It's going to happen. It's gonna happen. It could happen any minute, but nobody knows the day or the hour, right? So, so don't worry too much about it because we just can't know. But, it, but it's going to be soon, but I can't tell you when. Probably won't be tomorrow during the eclipse. I can't tell you when, but it's going to be soon. Well, then years later, like Luke is saying, I'm t people keep setting us up and they keep getting it wrong. And so Luke says, you know what? Let's quit worrying about it all because it's happened. How about that? Luke has a very elegant solution. It happened. He said it'd be quick, and it was, because here we are. The church is now the returned and resurrected body of Christ, and it's meant to go out into the world and continue the Christ mission of resisting oppression and healing the hurting and touching the untouchable and loving the unloved. Resurrection, ascension, the return of Christ. Maybe they're all the same. Maybe there are different stories telling the same truth. Each of these stories tell us that love wins, that Jesus' mission still matters that it's up to us to continue that mission, that ours are the hands of God, that we are the body of Christ, that it's up to us to keep caring and loving and being that witness and being that voice. We are called and empowered to do it. They have been waiting and dreaming of a glorious return. But as the old hymn from Rocky Horror tells us, don't dream it, be it, don't dream it, be it, I'm going to sing it until you join me. Don't dream it, be it, don't dream it, be it. Mark's gospel shows Jesus sending disciples out to help people feel home helping them shake off their demons, helping them rise to their potential, helping them to navigate the difficulties of the world. So Mark has Jesus sending them out. Well, Luke has read Mark and uses Mark's work and another source that we call Q, but also he puts his own stuff. It's called the L source. Anything that's unique to Luke, that Luke made that up or found a tradition that no one else knew about. So he has read Mark, he's using Mark, but Luke puts his own stank on it. And for Luke, we are no longer waiting for a return. We are the return, and it's time to act like it. And we can, and we must, and we will, and this is the good news. Amen.